Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Victor Ramirez. This is my group that I'd like to introduce to you. Good morning. My name is Joy Vale. And good morning. My name is Demetrius Hoopis. And our presentation, as you can see today, is on speech impairment. So right off the bat, I want to go through the overview of this disability. And really what we do is we break down speech and impairment to two different parts. Speech refers to the way sounds and words are formed, whereas impairment really just refers to any condition that diminishes the function of speaking or communicating with others. So speech impairments can be something that could be physical or it could be developmental, and these could be different setbacks that could hold back students. And as far as testing students and doing assessments, uh, really what we do in the education system is we look and see if they're below average in performance and language, articulation, and abnormal patterns in voice or fluency. And this is really where we start to build that IEP and we request special education services. And of course, we get our uh, referral to the speech pathologist where we could further identify therapies that can best support each individual student. Okay, now when we look at the classification of the disability, uh, we're looking at the definition uh, according to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA. Uh, the definition given there is really a speech or language impairment means a communication disorder such as stuttering, impaired articulation, a language impairment, or a voice impairment that adversely affects a child's education performance. Uh, so these are some of the warning signs that you could keep in mind. Now, there are various uh, examples of speech impairment. Some of the most common that we will come across as educators would be stuttering, articulation errors, tongue tie, apraxia, and selective mutism, which is sometimes when students uh, don't feel that confidence to speak, they will, they will continue to be silent. All right, now we're looking at the prevalence of the disability. Now, according to the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, any combination of speech impairments can be present in children between the ages of three and 17. And that rate is one in 12. So really what this means is for us educators in a classroom of 25, you're likely to see at least two students at any given time that have some form of a speech impairment. As far as prevalence in our society, 7.6% of US adults ages 18 and over have, reporting, have reported having problems with speech within the last 12 months. And just a really cool, interesting fact that I want to pass on to all of us as educators, uh, James Earl jo Jones, one of the most famous voice actors you could think of, he's voiced Darth Vader and Mufasa and the Lion King. He was really traumatized at the age of five and developed a stutter. And all throughout grade school, he really had that mutism, did not want to speak up. He was really worried about his stutter. And it wasn't until high school that his teacher helped him overcome that challenge. He helped him overcome that speech impairment. So as educators, it's important to realize that at any age, we could still make a difference. Uh, real quick, I want to show you all a uh, chart that we have here, prevalence of disability, this is continued. And really feel free to pause if need be, but really what I want you to focus on on the left-hand side, uh, as you can see, uh, children ages three to 10 years old, speech problems are only about 41.8%. So this is speech problems with uh, the way that they articulate their words and the way that they're uh, presenting their words. Whereas when they're a little bit older, between the ages of 11 and 17, we notice that that kind of gets split in half where speech problems are a lot less obvious. By this point, they've been identified. They probably have an IEP. They've improved their speech patterns, maybe with the help of a speech pathologist. And then the, the, the second most um, worrisome right below there is uh, language problems. So this could be uh, different types of situations where we even have English learners that uh, are coming in and they're also part of this pie chart. So some things to keep in mind. Okay. And uh, finally here, we're looking at causes of the disability. So speech impairments can manifest at different times for different reasons. And some of the causes here include 
is uh, stuttering. So stuttering could be a developmental delay or it could also be hereditary. Uh, dyslexia, which is really important to keep in mind, this is one of the most common as it factors into a person's ability to read and pronounce words. Uh, we do understand that dyslexia is part of the site that we're looking at the words, but it's also important to keep in mind that if students don't see the words correctly, they probably can't pronounce the words correctly. Now, ASD, this is also a very common thing for them as they may struggle with interacting with others using verbal or nonverbal communication cues. And cerebral palsy and just overall brain injuries, these are people that have trouble coordinating their muscles for movement or speech. And finally, hearing loss. This can be hereditary or due to injury. This makes auditory sounds harder to hear or to pronounce. In the following couple slides, we will discuss the identification and screening of speech and language impairment and the psychological, behavioral, social, and emotional characteristics of the disability. Let's watch a quick video. Did you enunciate? Alexa, see, nothing. What's Alexa's energy level? She's got plenty of juice. Could Alexa be in sleep mode? Um, okay. Could Alexa have a communication disorder? Hi. Kids don't come with a manual. Learn the signs of communication disorders and find an audiologist or speech language pathologist who can help. So your first impression may be that this child is very young to be looking at a speech or language disorder, but that's just simply not true. Early identification is critical because it leads to treatments that are shorter in duration and less expensive to deliver. What we know is the wait and see approach is just not successful. Typically, speech and language impairments emerge during early developmental periods of children. And if diagnosed after the age of four, the impairment is likely to be stable over time and typically persist into adulthood. So how do we identify speech and language impairments? We look for signs. Next slide, please. The signs of speech and language impairment are varied for children and they are broken up into different categories. We have characteristic, characteristics of speech impairment and characteristics of language impairment. As seen here, the characteristics of speech impairment, excuse me, um, are the articulation, fluency and voice. And there are different signs that we can look at as we're trying to identify these impairments. For signs of speech sound impairment, which is the mispronunciation of vowel sounds like P, B, M, H. And that usually occurs between one and two years old. And then if you get into other vowel sounds, K, G, F, T, D, those are um, seen within two to three years of age. So as you see here, early identification really is that. And services for um, early identification are mandated through the um, law, federal law of IDEA. So we continue to see different signs um, of speech impairment through the older years as well. Um, next slide, please. The characteristics of language impairment um, are also categorized into different areas. Um, the articulation disorders are errors when making speech sounds related to bodily limitations. For example, a cleft palate. Um, these disorders include like omissions or substitutions in speech. Fluency disorders are uh, difficulties with the cadence of your speech. They include stuttering, rapid response, uh, like when you repeat consonants or vowels over and over and over for prolongated of time. And then there's voice disorders also, which is just simply that. Um, 
it has to do with the physical problems within your larynx and you either sound very hoarse or um, have no speech at all. The morphological disorders are defined as difficulties um, with inflection. For example, if you say the word conflict or conflict and morphological disorders would be an inability to decipher the difference of where to emphasize different syllables. So conflict means you didn't, you know, um, like two accounts of what happened don't match up, right? They conflict, but a conflict, completely different meaning, means I don't agree about something. However, there are commonly confusions with pronunciation. So we see that here. Semantic disorders are characterized by poor vocabulary development, inappropriate use of word meaning, and sometimes the inability to comprehend word meanings, um, which make it under hard to understand what other people are saying and to interpret what they're trying to get across. Syntax deficits are characterized by difficulty of getting to know the rules that govern the order of rules, like grammar, subject verb pairing, things like that. So you might hear somebody saying, me want more instead of I want more. There's a subject verb pairing that just isn't matching up. And it can be related to language impairment. Pragmatic difficulties are problems in understanding and using language in different social contexts. For example, very commonly you see students who don't want to make eye contact or they, they don't respect personal space or they have an issue maybe um, requesting information. And that all leads back to pra pragmatic difficulties under the umbrella of language impairment. That can all be helped again with early intervention methods. Um, and it is constantly encouraged um, in the school system um, that by audiologists and speech pathologists, teachers alike, um, that if we can hit it early, we can make the largest difference in improving a student's speech and language abilities. There are, next slide please. The, there are um, some tests that are used to, uh, to, you know, dictate whether a child has a speech and language disorder. However, it has um, been shown that tests performed within a primary care setting just simply do not work. They're not valid, they're not reliable. And so most of the time when there is identification of students with these needs, it's based on a parent concern or perhaps upon a child entering um, the school environment and going through their first year, second year of school, a teacher will voice their concerns or perhaps they've come in contact with a speech therapist or an audiologist who notice some differences. But largely, this is based on, um, on, on parent concern. So there is the stages excuse me, the phases and stages um, development pro protocol um, that we use. There are a couple other tests here also. All of these are mainly parent driven. Um, they're even within the school context, if a audiologist, speech therapist, teacher is making recommendations, they're largely based on parent input because that is what they see the most of. Something um, useful to know that, you know, we really need to pay attention as parents to our kids at home and not put it off, not put it off like, oh, we'll wait and see because the whole, again, the whole wait and see scenario typically doesn't work out. And then by, by the time the intervention comes in, 
um, oftentimes developmental stages have already been made and it's hard to reverse those. Next slide, please. There are psychological, behavioral, emotional, and social considerations to take into, um, into thought with children with spoken language disorders, including speech and language. Um, this is a word cloud, just kind of simplifying some of the issues that students go through. They're oftentimes unsure of themselves and experience a high level of self-doubt um, because they're unable to communicate effectively with not only other peers, other adults, the, their parents themselves, and it may affect how they communicate with themselves. They also exhibit behavioral difficulties, including hyperactivity and attention deficit disorder. They show um, general social withdrawal, wariness, shyness, which can lead to a lack of close relationships in life. They have difficulty regulating emotions, monitoring, evaluating, and modifying their reactions. Um, they also have poor social self-esteem. That's a huge one. Self-esteem has so much to do with how kids move through their day. Students move through their day socially based on a level of self-esteem. And if, again, if we can use that early intervention to come in and boost their self-esteem, we will see the previous behaviors that I've just discussed probably decrease. So here we have five suggestions for working with students with speech or language impairment in the general education classroom. And uh, we're talking about two things in regards to this section. We're talking about assistive technology, which is on this slide. And on the next slide, we'll also um, talk about instructional strategies, okay? So in terms of assistive technology, we're talking about computer software pro programs, and we're talking about augmentative and alternative communication, which is known as AAC, okay? And let me check the slide and make sure, okay, good. All right, so, um, so in terms of assistive technology, uh, and we're talking about computer software programs, um, they're designed to improve the child's speech or language ability, okay? So we have um, one kind of software I found was called Speech Journal, and that is, um, audio webbed images for multiple learning teaching goals. And the other software I found was called Articulation Station uh, for helping students with letter and word pronunciation. And the third um, software I found was called Claro Speak. And this gives kids a voice uh, with supportive quality text to speech um, tools. Okay. And um, the next section here is also. Uh, about AAC, okay? And um, so AAC is the use of symbols, aids, strategies, and techniques to enhance the communication process. Uh, this includes sign language, various communication boards, in both manual and electronic devices to help those who have trouble with communication, okay? And um, so the first kind is unaided communication systems, and this relies on the user's body, to convey messages. So for example, uh, for example, gestures, body language, and our sign language. Uh, one advantage of this unaided communication system is that it does not require any technology beyond the person's body. And then there's a uh, low-tech AAC. And this is any type of aid that does not require batteries or electricity. This includes things like a simple pen and paper to write messages on, as well as picture boards that can be carried to aid communication. Um, also on picture boards, users can point to images, uh, words, pictures, drawings, or letters in order to communicate their message. Uh, the pointing might be done with the user's, user's hands, other body parts, and eye gaze, or a pointer held in the hands or mouth. And the last kind you'll see here is the high-tech AAC, and this is any aid that requires electricity or batteries. This includes specialized devices, software, smartphone applications, electronic communication boards and keyboards. Uh, many high-tech AC devices are speech generating devices, which means they can produce digitalized speech when the user either types a message or presses on images, words, or letters. All right, so uh, next slide, please. Next slide, excellent, okay. So uh, here is the second part 
of the, of the uh, five suggestions for working with students with speech or language impairment in the general education classroom. And so instructional strategies are composed, are composed of language, speech, uh, academics and behavior and the physical um, aspect, okay? So for language, um, educators should paraphrase back what the student has said or indicated, um, ensure that the student has a way to approximately express their wants and needs, um, emphasize goals and tasks that are easy for the student to accomplish, um, use computers in the classroom for language enhancement. In terms of speech, uh, this means um, insert oral presentations into lesson plans and classwork, place students in groups, allowing them to have discussions with their peers, provide students opportunities to read aloud in the classroom. Um, however, this is very important, teachers should not put these children in a in a position where they are going to feel embarrassed, okay? And the other section here is academics and behavior. And um, so you should allow students to tape lectures, allow extra time to complete work because of distractions, slow handwriting or problems in decoding text, um, design text and presentations that are appropriate for the student, um, whether that's written or oral, okay? and redirect the student frequently and provide step-by-step -step directions and repeat when necessary. And then in terms of the physical aspect, be aware that because of the way the brain develops, it is easier to acquire language and communication skills before the age of five. Um, be aware that if children have muscular disorders, hearing problems, or developmental delays, their acquisition of speech, language, and related skills may be affected and use augmentative communication systems to ensure that nonverbal students and students with severe physical disabilities have effective ways to communicate and um, ensure that the student has access to their uh, portable communication system across all contexts all the time. Um, now, I actually went through speech therapy for a certain problem um, in elementary school. And actually my teacher would give me a signal during class, a secret signal to tell me to uh, slow down. Um, so I would stop stuttering. That was one thing that helped me out. Um, okay, and then the uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here we have five suggestions for parents of the children with a disability. So if your toddler or young child is having difficulty speaking, then having the child's hearing checked is a critical first step because a hearing impairment may be interfering with his or her developmental a language, okay? And it's essential to provide help and support as soon as a problem is identified because all communication disorders carry the potential to isolate individuals from their social and educational surroundings. Also, early intervention is a mandated system of services by IDEA that helps babies and toddlers with developmental delays or disabilities. Early intervention focuses on helping eligible babies and toddlers learn the basics and brand new skills that typically develop during the first three years of life. Um, older children in the public school system may be evaluated by a professional and receive individualized educational program, which is an IEP, to receive services for treating their disability. And um, there's also something called the IFSP, which is called an individualized family service plan, and this can be developed to provide early intervention services to your child and as necessary to your family. And then some, some general tips are, um, you should learn the, learn the specifics of your child's speech or language impairment. The more you know, the more you can help yourself and your child. Um, be patient, your child, like every child has a whole lifetime to learn and grow. Um, meet with the school and develop an IEP to address your child's needs, uh, be your child's advocate, know your son or daughter best, uh, share what you know, uh, be well informed about the speech language therapy your son or daughter is receiving, talk with the SLP and find how to augment and enrich the therapy at home and in other environments, also find out what not to do. Uh, um, give your child chores, chores build confidence and ability, keep your child's age, attention span, and abilities in mind, break down jobs into smaller steps, 
They explain uh, what to do step by step until the job is done, uh, demonstrate, provide help when it's needed, praise a job well done, and also uh, listen to your child. So don't rush to fill gaps or make corrections. Conversely, don't force your child to speak. Be aware of the other ways in which communication takes place between people. Um, talk to other parents whose children have a similar speech or language impairment. Parents can share practical advice and emotional support. Um, see if there's a parent nearby by visiting the Parent to Parent USA program and using the interactive map. And keep in touch with your child's teachers, offer support, demonstrate any assistive technology your child uses and provide any information teachers will need. Find out how you can augment your child's school learning at home. All right, everyone. So this is just a quick overview of our resources. Feel free, if need be, to pause, click. There's a lot of great resources here that we utilize for this presentation. Um, so feel free to take a quick look at that. And um, an additional uh, resource page here as well. Uh, finally, I just want to go ahead and say thank you once again for all of you for tuning in. Uh, once again, I was Victor Ramirez, and I'll just go ahead and say goodbye with the rest of my colleagues. Demetrius and Joy, please say goodbye to everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Take care, and don't study too hard. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Have a good evening.